Empty Pockets by Petra Söderling. A conversation about governments, technologies and innovation. You're now listening to season three of Winter 2024. I call this season The Book Club. In March 2023, I published my own book, Governments and Innovation, The Economic Developer's Guide to Our Future, which is available in Amazon in paperback, hardcover, and as a Kindle ebook. It's now time to look at some other great books out there that discuss the same theme, how publicly funded technologies turn into privately run innovation, and what happens after that. Our theme song is by New Orleans jazz icon, Leroy Jones. Deep Pockets works in cooperation with Studio Aguse, a boutique recording studio in south of France for audiobooks, podcasts and music. I recently did a presentation on innovation trends for executives working in foreign direct investment. One of the tools I introduced to this crowd was the Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies. If you're not familiar with it, the annual Gartner hype cycle introduces a number of emerging technologies on a curve, which depicts at which point of hype the technology in question is. The hype cycle is divided in five stages. First, there's innovation trigger, when we we first start to hear about a certain new technology. Then peak of inflated expectations. This is where the hype ends. Trough of disillusionment. Hopes come gushing down. Then slope of enlightenment. Maybe we can use this technology for something. And finally, the plateau of productivity people are making money with it. I've followed the Gartner hype cycle for over 20 years. And by the way, I actually dug up the 2003 hype cycle and did a quick analysis on how their predictions held water. But that's another story. Blockchain reached the peak of inflated expectations somewhere around 2017 and has been moving towards more solid commercial applications since. With cryptocurrencies and NFTs losing traction in investment, people are looking at other ways to utilize blockchain and its sister technology, Web3. In the studio today, I have someone who knows how to put decentralized web into use in the healthcare sector, Dr. Brigitte Pinievski. Over the years, in roles ranging from a medical executive and accomplished author to researcher, laboratory medicine specialist, and presently a health tech startup advisor and Web3 AI speaker, Dr. Pinevsky has underscored the imperative for individually specific health intelligence. As Web3 and AI advance new technical instruments, diverse stakeholders are desperate for a clear understanding of the path to society's next data-driven wealth inflection. Dr. Pinevsky's extensive experience in multidisciplinary collaborations has set the stage with notable milestones. Book launch regarding the Web3 AI transformation of health, wealth care, demystifying Web3 and the rise of personal data economies. Multiple academic papers covering artificial intelligence approaches with the semantic mining of social Activity and Health, collaboration with the University of Oregon, Kent State University, University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and George Washington School of Nursing. Point-of-care test results transferred to the electronic recording using mobile technology with iStock in Finland. Advancing the search for breast cancer markers in human tear samples, Namida Lab, Arkansas. U.S. Authored the Personalized Medicine and Public Health Chapter to the Wireless Health Textbook by Miran Miragani, Ph.D., Case Western Reserve University, San Diego, California. So, 
Dr. Pinievsky, or may I call you Brigitte? Welcome to Deep Pockets. Thank you. Nice to be here. And yes, please call me Brigitte. Great. Thank you. I've just read your official bio, but in your own words, can you please describe your background to the audience? How did you become Dr. Brigitte Binievsky, researcher and author? Well, uh, I started my training actually in uh, math and physics. And when I moved over, <clears throat> excuse me, to medicine, I was shocked at the lack of precision. We are constantly offering patients the, uh, a clinical suspicion. We say, it looks like you have X, so let's try medication Y and see how you do. Come back and let me know. And, and this imprecision was really difficult to work with, knowing, of course, that our technical advances have been moving at a pace that is so impressive. It feels as if we can deliver new technology over the weekend, yet we are operating in a medical uh, system and a medical intelligence that is so slow and very much lacking in personalization. Meanwhile, of course, our population is becoming more and more unwell. We have diseases of aging now occurring in young populations. Mm. I mean, type 2 diabetes used to be a chronic disease of aging, happened in your, in your 50s, 60s, 70s. And um, now, of course, 50% of pediatric diabetes is type 2. So while we've moved our world to change food from farm food to factory food. We've automated the movement out of our lives. We've changed the photo period such that we can have 24 hours of daylight, all of which our biology has no understanding of. We are still operating with the same biological operating system that we were given centuries ago. And so what I saw was an opportunity to use technology, not like other industries, you know, the financial industry uses technology as an operational imperative to make transactions faster and to achieve greater profits. But in healthcare, we really have a growing medical imperative to use technology more effectively as we continue to see population health erode that's fascinating. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. Obviously, I'm for using technology for um, anything that advances humanity and our own health, of course. So your book, Wealth Care, Demystifying Web3 and the Rise of Personal Data Economies, is an, that's an interesting study of America's healthcare, or how you describe it, sick care, and Web3 uh, blockchain-based decentralized internet where users are in control. How did you end up putting these two together? Well, certainly I, I you know, started my practice, reasonably good physicians seeing patients one by one, and more and more these patterns kept um, exposing themselves. And I realized our individuals are so complex. Humanity is so complex, and yet we still apply very simplistic laws, such as the law of thermodynamics. We think that a, a calorie in equals a calorie out. And yet, I don't think any of us operate um, under those sort of simple conditions. And, and what really shocked me, of course, was when I started to see the young people. I thought it took four decades of suboptimal lifestyle to give us diabetes, heart disease, or stroke. But Interestingly, especially in the boys, I started to see that it was possible in just the four years of puberty to have a hormonally altered, uh, you know, four or five years of puberty that really drove completely different outputs for these kids. And of course, puberty is happening at a time at which children are too young to provide informed consent. Their parents don't even know the that this is happening. And so you have a situation which is not rare. Uh, children in the U.S., adolescents are at least a third of them are overweight or obese. Mm. And adiposity, adipose tissue, is a hormonally active tissue. And so you can have a situation whereby families, children are completely unaware and actually marching into very early onset diabetes, which of course 
starts to um, mean early amputation, early blindness, renal failure, wow. et cetera. And not only just the physical manifestations, what was really pronounced were the other manifestations. You see these children having uh, compromised potential in every domain of human functioning. They're not going for the big job or they're not taking the big exam. They're not even going for the big relationship. Mm -hmm. They hope to stay just on a screen, bother no one. Hopefully no one will bother them. And, um, and of course this drives their parents crazy. They should be out looking for work. Uh, and so I realized that these conditions are very complex. We apply simple understanding, uh, based on, you know, our limited knowledge that has um, been available only through tra traditional uh, study methods. And now we really need to take advantage of the fact that we have technology that could underpin a world in which we understood the minutia of our lives in safe and effective ways. I mean, businesses use AI and technology to manage thousands of moving parts in order to ensure that their performance is maximized. Yet healthcare, we still offer average to everyone. We don't see individuals. We see a population when you come to visit. And we apply population-based understanding to individuals, as I say, in the hopes that we'll hit the right diagnosis and, and come up with the right plan. But that means no one really has access in, in a deliberate way to an optimal outcome. They have access to an average outcome. Understanding what drives optimal would be needing to understand the minutia of the um, health experiences, of those individuals that did achieve optimal and make that minutia available to others as well. So in, in summary, it's really frustrating as a clinician to see patients over and over again, realizing that what we're delivering is grossly underperforming for their specific needs. Humans are amazingly complex, but the tools are here now to do more and achieve much more. It will take a different model, a model where it's the participation of the people, by the people, for the people. And I always think of Steve Jobs and others who, who really sort of highlighted the fact that our healthcare is so out of date. I mean, Steve had every um, opportunity for the best access to health care possible. And yet he, like many of us, um, you know, basically used hope, but hope is not a strategy. We all hope that we don't get ill. And then we hope that if we do get ill, medicine will be there to rescue us. And of course, that's not always the case. Um, and so the world could have been perhaps different if in fact we were already fast forward to a place where the minutia of our lives were safely digitized and that we could share that with each other so that individuals like Steve might have been warned early on that he was in a track that was suspicious for the onset of pancreatic cancer in the future. And maybe those details would have helped him move from his current track into a different track, mm -hmm. perhaps avoiding and, or as I said earlier, even with pancreatic cancer, have access to who had the most optimal outcomes, what were the details behind that, and how is it possible to achieve an optimal outcome when it comes to something like pancreatic cancer? Wow. Yes. Uh, well, from Steve Jobs, uh, this is a good segue to my next question. Uh, many in our audience are from the tech world, and use wearable health tech such as Apple Watches or Fitbit. And um, I've also personally done the 23andMe genetics analysis and received health pointers from there. So, uh, you know, we're already kind of doing this. How is the Web3-based approach different from, from what we're doing today? So I think what we're doing today is just a fraction of what is actually mm -hmm. possible. What we're seeing, of course, with devices is our own data just reflected back at us. And uh, so with our devices, that's quite interesting initially, but over time it fatigues. What we would like to see is an opportunity to not just have our own data reflected back at us, but really have the opportunity to query everyone else's data oh. in ways that make sense. 
And, and so, yes, we are all physical first. Uh, we live our lives in the physical domain, and these apps and uh, devices are making it more and more possible for us to convert this physical health expression into zeros and ones, into a digital health expression that can be explorable. And with Web3 and uh, blockchain-based solutions, we have an opportunity to make sure that our privacy and security is baked in. It's not an add-on. And it's an opportunity also to pre-set conditions such that the effort each of us has to expend is minimized so that we ha- it's very easy to take data from my device or my app and have it move to what I call my home base. Home base is a place uh, where we could keep our longitudinal health records and other records such that it would always be available for exploration, exploration by ourselves and each other according to our preferences. In this way, we have an opportunity with each other to define what's reachable. I mean, it's crazy that you and I and probably everybody listening to this podcast, we all have the same threshold for lipids, for example. That threshold has nothing to do with what's optimal for us at this moment in our lives. It has to do with whether or not I can give you a medication based on your lab value. And so we see a future whereby multitudes of individuals would be able to define what's actually reachable for an HDL, for instance, in your 20s. Perhaps if you have an HDL that is only 34, the data from many people would be able to show you that actually in your 20s, you might be able to achieve an HDL of 84. And by the way, these are the detailed uh, explanations of how you get there. And so that's the type of of, um, opportunity we see from devices and apps, which of course, as I said, we're only scratching the surface of currently. What we'd like to do is move into a world where all of us have, under our own purview, thousands of parameters that define us today and the decades of our lives that we've already um, achieved and have the ability of a personal AI to scan that on a regular basis to give us insights that we're requesting and to also use the insights from other people's health expressions as have been approved for that use so that we don't live our lives having to figure things out one by one. I mean, it's impossible for an individual to figure out, you know, which yoga will work for migraines (laughs) in isolation. But with a group, that's something, a group of migraine sufferers, that's something we can figure out together. Hmm. So what I talk about in the book is a three zone model. The Bottom zone, of course, home base, where we keep our information safe and secure and and working for us according to our preferences. The second zone is a benevolent or non-rivalrous AI that is constantly looking for correlations and serves up correlations only to individuals and groups. And then the third zone is the commercial zone, which accepts correlations that have been approved for delivery to zone three and adds scientific rigor and turns these um, correlations into insights and new products and services. What's interesting is this model has a built-in incentive to participate, of course. Other industries, like the financial industry, you might argue, does not have a built-in incentive to onboard those with low assets. But in health and health intelligence, we have a huge incentive to onboard not just those who are exhibiting exceptional health or good health, but really everyone, anyone experiencing poor health is also really important to share their information such that we can define the truth. Yes. So you've um, laid out the problem. You uh, told us uh, what the possible solution could be, but how to get there. So how do you see this idea evolving and becoming a reality? As you write in the book, there's a pushback out there as health tech companies, hospitals and insurance companies, they make money from the current model. So what to do? 
Yeah, exactly. And, and money matters, of course, uh, nothing happens unless there is an opportunity for profit. And so I don't see this as, uh, as some, you know, ex- folks that are excited about the future seem to think that we're going to dismantle and rebuild a new system that currently is, I don't think the plan or even feasible, but recall that uh, Bitcoin showed up alongside finance. Bitcoin did not do anything to the Mm -hmm. financial system. It just showed up alongside as an alternative way of exchanging value and storing value. And, it um, continues to, you know, be utilized today. So there currently is no plan to disrupt the current system, but really to build this three-zone model alongside the current system and have individuals on board according to their own preferences. I think the real silver lining here is that industry is waking up to the fact that they have amazing tools in the form of AI, but what's really lacking is the opportunity to train that eye with health data, because of course, industry does not have health data. It only has disease management data. It has our clinic and hospital visits. You cannot back engineer health from those visits. And health is something that happens between clinic and hospital visits. It happens in the household, in the home, in your socialization. And it's the thing that we are currently picking up now, as you mentioned, with apps and wearables. And we are, um, as individuals, already the manager of our the ebb and flow of our health expression. And so I think there's a real opportunity to create a safe and easy to use place to dump the minutia of our lives in a way in which it'll be so effective for ourselves, even just for recall to begin with, because of course, human recall is so faulty. Mm. You ask somebody what cream did they use for that rash two years ago? They have no idea. People have no idea when their last tetanus shot was. It's an, it's interesting. It'll be, it'll be comical to future generations that we all lived our life with almost no knowledge of our past health expression yeah. and uh, and they'll be living their lives with instant complete and totally accurate recall for every moment that anything happened to them that they decided to enter into their home base and that's the beauty of ai of course it doesn't um, forget and there is lim- there is very few restraints on how much it can manage. I mean, we're seeing models that manage trillions of parameters at a time. So I see currently teams already working on a very interesting case, use case, which is individuals who have positive genetic markers for, you know, the, a future that includes significant disease. But we know that um, at, even in breast cancer, at least 50% of people with breast cancer markers are not going to demonstrate that disease. But who are they and why are they not demonstrating that disease? These are things that our current model would never be able to uncover in time to make a difference. And yet this is something that this three zone model with all of us working together, ensuring that no important details are missed or forgotten, can start to define what what are the cluster of occurrences that matter that actually achieve no, uh, you know, a future where someone with a positive marker is not actually going to express that disease. We also see other groups working with this technology, high performance athletes, for instance, of course, their health is their wealth to begin with. And then other natural uh, remedies such as cannabis are using this model to ensure that each use is not wasted. We already have seed to sale data. So we have the DNA, DNA data of the product being used. And so individuals record uh, parameters of that, that use. Did it work for sleep or pain or anxiety? And um, that information is not lost and then shared with the community such that the community is actually building the science by which this natural therapeutic can be utilized most effectively for individuals and each other. We also have a hair DAO, so hair replacement is big business. And then there's a Indigi DAO for uh, indigenous people. Indigenous people really um, value their property and and knowledge in ways that um, 
are supported by those providing grants, such as the Robert Wood Johnson grant recently for 8,000K in the Indigidown. So lots of Lots of activity in this area, and I think we're very much at the beginning, just at the cusp of what's possible. That's so, so fascinating. Uh, I really recommend everyone reading the book. Um, okay, my last question, and I asked the same question uh, of all of the guests here in the podcast. So, yeah, you talked about the future, but how do you see the future of our planet and humankind? And what's your message to the young people out there on verge of adulthood? So, yeah, the the verge of adulthood always reminds me of, you know, we went to school thinking that uh, education was a foundation. It was concrete and we were building, uh, you know, a massive building that would sustain us for our lives. And, and now, of course, knowledge and the world is changing so rapidly that we need to think about not teaching our kids to build concrete foundations, but really to think about learning and and flexibility as if we were building tents you know pick them up move Mm. them and be available for the next uh change that is around the corner because knowledge is going to be up to us our our world is too complex we can't uh, rely on industry or even academia to uh, supply us with effective knowledge in time to make a difference it'll be up to us the crowd to expand to generate experience-based evidence for ourselves and each other. And I'd also so just don't think of Web3 as a technology so much as an ethos. This is the ethos of Web1 when the internet was available for everyone in the same way. We could all use the internet for um, information. And then, of course, Web2 came along where we started to use the internet for um, commerce and websites, and we had immediate um, disruption or asymmetry where companies and um, and it's a small group of individuals could take advantage of that commerce to a much greater degree than individuals. And so we were in a, a place now with Web3, we think about that as going back to Web1, where all of us participate with our data streams in ways that provide us, yes, more health, but also more wealth, where we participate in marketplaces according to our own wishes and um, create an effective uh, economic future for ourselves using these data streams. And AI is actually going to be that forcing function because, as we mentioned earlier, AI is missing a massive amount of data that it needs to supply us with the best health outcomes. We are, um, we are talking about the hype cycle and Gartner uh, hype cycle at the beginning, and AI has certainly hit yet another. So mm-hmm. always think of a cycle not as a single cycle, but as a series of cycles because AI is not new, of course. It's been here, but it's hit its hit a new height in terms of AI uh, height currently. And A16Z came out with an article almost a year ago now talking about the biggest company in the world being a healthcare company, which makes sense for all sorts of reasons. I did a quick post on that in my LinkedIn, so we don't have to go into detail here. But I would just caution our listeners with respect to AI, again, not thinking of it as a traditional tool. It's not really a tool the way we think of tools traditionally because of two main reasons. And these were highlighted by Yuval Noah Harari in a podcast with Lex Freeman recently. And the first one, of course, is that AI has ideas. Remember, the um, printing press could print every idea mankind ever came up with, but it could come up with no idea itself. Mm. And then the second thing that AI can do is make a decision. I mean, we, the people, can build an atomic bomb, but that bomb has no ability to decide on a direction or when to go off or not. These are two properties that are not um, traditional, not there for traditional tools, but AI can do both. It can generate ideas and it can make decisions. So therefore, very much a different uh, a different solution than what we're used to. And I don't um, think of it uh, in a fatalistic manner. I just bring that up to say this is, this is more than we, what we've built previously, and it deserves more attention. And, of course, it deserves the participation of all of us 
And that's why it's so important for we, the people, to create this fire hose of truth, the minutia of our lives available so that there can be no confusion as to what we're actually achieving with AI. Are we achieving uh, humanity that is flourishing or humanity that is suffering? There we have it. Dr. Brigitte Pinevsky, author of Wealth Care, Demystifying Web3 and the Rise of Personal Data Economies. Thank you for visiting Deep Pockets. The book is available on Amazon as paperback, Kindle, and audiobook, also available as a limited edition NFT on Alexandria Labs and OpenSea. Thank you. My pleasure, Petra. Thank you for having me. You've listened to Deep Pockets by Petra Söderling. To subscribe for more content like this, go to petrasoderling.com. The wonderful music you heard is by Leroy Jones, an iconic New Orleans Jazz Hall of Fame trumpetist. You can find this and other Leroy Jones tunes at your favorite online or offline music store. Deep Pockets works in cooperation with Maison de la Guse, a quaint bed and breakfast, and Studio à Guse, a boutique recording studio in south of France for audiobooks, podcasts, and music. Stay in the beautiful bed and breakfast maison while recording your work assisted by top hospitality and audio technology professionals. Find on Instagram as Studio Aguse, that's A-G-U-Z-E. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe, like, rate and share our episodes. It means a lot to me and to my guests. We appreciate your support. Thank you.